Good morning and welcome again to uh, Coffee Kids and Sports Medicine. We talked about earlier, this is a little bit of a different format. We're going to talk a little bit about pediatric musculoskeletal imaging, and we really want to weigh really heavy on learning some of the basics on pediatric imaging and, and what, what's out there right now. A little bit of what's new, a little bit about what's old, and a little bit about some basics. Um, so we have a lot of different people that that watch us from a live stream or from uh, they're here in the audience from a variety of specialties. Uh, so we want to really make it valuable and useful for everybody. But don't hesitate to ask questions. You know, our assumption is that sometimes uh, you guys don't get to look at x-rays as much as we do, but sometimes you'll get a, an x-ray report and you don't know what to do with it. So we're going to try to go over that a little bit with you guys today. So um, you guys know me because I usually introduce most of the times. Uh, I'm Henry Ellis, uh, one of the sports medicine surgeons here. I'm going to introduce uh, Jared Montgomery, who um, is also co-director of the course. Uh, he's really the brains behind the schedule. So if you guys have any suggestions for next year, be sure to email uh, Jared or myself. Uh, he, act, he is uh, the leader of our fracture clinic, which has uh, really been tremendously successful, and he's uh, really uh, produce a successful clinic, but uh, in and of itself, himself professionally, has become one of the preeminent uh, fracture care uh, providers in North Texas. So uh, it's really excited to have him here, for, particularly for this lecture. Um, and then we have uh, here we have Joseph Chang, who is a radiologist, and we recruited him here because of his uh, underlying specialty, um, which is not only uh, pediatric musculoskeletal radiology, uh, but he comes from us from Cincinnati and also with a skill set of uh, diagnostic ultrasound, uh, which is really helpful in kids um, because there's almost no harm in utilizing ultrasound um, and it's really easy to do. Sometimes you can avoid an MRI radiation by the use of ultrasound, so that's one of his skill sets um, that brings him here to Scottish Rite. So with that being said, I'm going to give the microphone over to to uh, Dr. Chang and Jared and I will participate when we can. Thank you. Okay. Uh, let's see what the mouse is. <clears throat> so I want to uh, thank Dr. Ellis and Jared for uh, involving me in uh, today's presentation. Um, it is my pleasure to be here speaking with you guys. So what is EOS? So one of the mo one of the most frequent diagnoses that we treat at uh, Scottish Rite is scoliosis. And it's something that happens in our adolescents, particularly through growth. And there are many treatments depending on the severity of scoliosis, but the best way for us to determine the treatment is to really look at them, look at their curves radiographically over a period of time. And so that's real, so it's not only the curve that's, that's important, but it's how it progresses over time that gives us a tremendous amount of information. And so that's why we get repeat x-rays on these kids. So, so Joseph, what can we do about that? Is there, t tell me a little bit about what our imaging options are for these kids when we're doing repeat or serial imaging. Okay, so uh, that's a good question. So typically, uh, you can do traditional x-rays and there are a, there's a new uh, imaging modality called EOS imaging, um, which, you know, in this case, SOFI is a good uh, option because uh, EOS, um, with it, we can simultaneously obtain AP and lateral view of the spine and also a uh, AP, PA view of the left hand. Uh, take a look at these microdose um, EOS films, uh, which produce even less radiation than standard dose EOS images. Uh, you can see the scoliosis curvature, do measurements on them, and you can see vertebral body bony details. And to the right, you see a left-hand EOS film that produces ad adequate detail for uh, bone age uh, determination. So, so can I just, uh, yeah, real quick, I just want to... Uh, yeah. So did I hear you correctly? You get, you, there's, a, there's a decrease in radiation dose. Yes but you still have the ability to see what you need to over time. That's correct, and we're gonna go into that a little bit. Um, the, uh, so, so I'm just gonna show you some more examples. So these are three microdose EOS films that we use to follow uh, Sophie's uh, spinal curvature, and uh, even when you know, she wears a spine brace in this middle image, you can still see the details in the bone to do measurements and so forth. And the, um, so anyway, it's just to kind of answer Dr. Ellis's question. So EOS is a uh, new uh, imaging modality um, that uh, uses a special uh, detector that can amplify the signal. So you require less radiation uh, exposure to produce similar kind of Im image with the, uh, compared to a uh, traditional X-ray. And uh, I, I have another example here of uh, EOS use. This time we are looking at the genivalgum or also known as knock knee. 
And uh, when compared to the two traditional X-rays to the left, um, the EOS images to the right provide good bony detail to evaluate for the knee alignment. And as you can see that this patient received a growth modulation device in the uh, distal femurs, and over time, it leads to complete uh, correction of genu valgum um, after the uh, placement of the devices. And so what is EOS? Again, you know, this is a um, new imaging modality, and uh, it is a low radiation X-ray dose uh, by planner X-ray machine that is designed to image the patient in a standing position. And again, like I say, they use a proprietary detector um, amplification algorithm to uh, basically use lower dose X-ray to acquire these images. And uh, so the way this machine is arranged, uh, it has two sets of X-ray tubes and detectors arranged in uh, 90 degree um, to each other to take AP and lateral images simultaneously. This makes it faster overall to acquire uh, spine and lower extremity images than traditional X-ray machines. It utilizes horizontal X-ray beam that moves up and down like a CT scanner on this image here you can see, um, as opposed to a diversion beam like a traditional X-ray. This reduces distortion, image distortion on the film and the artifact that we call parallax effect. Um, in addition, um, when you image long anatomy such as spine and lower extremities, multiple film cassettes are needed in traditional X-ray, which has to be stitched together um, by the technologists into one long image. EOS produces one single image by default and uh, eliminates these stitch artifacts and potential human error. If you look at these uh, two images to the right of the, of the screen, um, you know, the one on the left is a traditional X-ray, and you see two uh, subtle horizontal white lines running across the image, and these are stitch artifacts from the uh, traditional X-ray, and you do not see that with the EOS image to the right. Um, so at Scottish Rite, we uh, take every precaution to reduce child, uh, children's exposure to radiation. Um, EOS is another imaging tool that allows us to do so. Our internal test data suggests that standard, EO, st standard dose EOS uses approximately one-seventh of radiation dose compared to the traditional scoliosis X-ray, and that microdose EOS uses even less radiation than the standard dose EOS. In a scenario where, you know, if you have a child who needs to be imaged four times a year for 10 years to follow their scoliosis till skeletal maturity, by using the standard dose EOS versus traditional X-ray, you are looking at radiation dose saving that's equivalent to four chest CTs. And you can imagine how, you know, getting four extra chest CT worth of radiation exposure to these kids can potentially increase lifetime of cancer risk uh, in them. Uh, moreover, um, EOS can be more accurate than traditional X-ray for the same reasons that we talked about in the previous slide. Um, so when do we use uh, EOS? Uh, at our institution, uh, we use um, EOS in patients with deformities of the spine, hips, and lower extremities that require long-term imaging follow-up to assess disease progression and uh, treatment response. Your pediatric patients with these same problems may benefit from EOS imaging. Um, uh, that's it for the EOS. Do you have any question I, about EOS? Well, I, I, yeah. I guess I, I just want to uh, expand a little bit on that or, sure. and, and ask you a few questions. But, um, you know, EOS from, uh, from a provider standpoint is pretty new. Yes. Um, it, so, it sounds like it's relatively recent technology. Um, you know, is, is it common? Are there a lot of people that utilize the EOS technology uh, right now? So uh, currently, uh, only in certain uh, basically pediatric orthopedic uh, institutions, uh, such as you know, Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, Boston Children's, um, and certain university uh, facilities, they have the EOS machine because it costs more than a regular X-ray machine to buy. And uh, when you get reimbursed, they reimburse you as a regular X-ray. Uh, in terms of insurance payment and so forth. So it is not available in a lot of places, um, but we're fortunate that we have them, and we're able to provide uh, the service where we can reduce radiation dose in these children uh, for that reason. So what I'm, so, you know, what I'm hearing is that uh, you know, EOS is a, a relatively new technology. It's fairly rare. We have it here at pediatrics or, or at uh, Scottish Rite Hospital, yes. and it, it is perfect for pediatric conditions. Scoliosis, uh, oftentimes we treat knock kneed uh, or bow-legged or, or conditions that yes. are related to those when you have growth plate-related issues, and it's a great, it's a great uh, technology that allows us not only low-dose radiation, seems like sometimes in some sequences it may be even better than traditional imaging, and it, it's safer. 
Yes, uh, so like we talked about in one of the slides, I mean, you can do weight bearing, so we can really see the relationship between you know, the bones and the, the, the patient's alignment, and when they weight bear, sometimes when you take the uh, scoliosis film, when the patient lies down versus when they're standing, the degree of spinal curvature changes because they're not weight bearing when they're lying down. So you do get more accurate uh, evaluation of the alignment that way with the uh, standing position in the EOS machine. Yeah. Now, are there any downsides to the EOS? So the, the, the main issue with this imaging, uh, of course, you know, the patient needs to be standing. So if you have a patient who cannot stand, that's not possible for this imaging. And also, it takes a few seconds to acquire the image. For example, it takes 10 seconds to acquire the lower extremity or the spine x-ray with the EOS machine. So if you have a patient who is too immature, too young, and cannot stand still for that 10 seconds, you may not get uh, good image out of it, and they may have to have you know, regular x-rays, which can be acquired in less than a second. And, and can, you, can anyone get an EOS? Um, can you just, you know, if you saw a patient, uh, if, a, if it was a pediatrician or a therapist, I mean, can you just say, I want an EOS, scoli, <laughs> and they'd write it on a prescription and they hand it to the patient? Or um, is this something where, you know, you've got, you, you probably, you know, if they want to utilize the technology, they have to get linked into the Scottish Rite system? Uh, so, I, I, I might have to plan this question to Dr. Dempsey, who's our radiology director, but my understanding is that we are able to um, allow outside orders um, to be pr uh, processed here at Scottish Rite, and we can pr provide these uh, EOS imaging to your patients um, if they need them. Um, you just need to put in an order, we'll put it into our system, and our um, machine here or downtown can perform these studies for you. That sounds great. Do you, do you have any questions or comments? Yeah, I'd love to know. You know, we really don't utilize the EOS at all in the fracture clinic. Um, for some of those, the reasons you just mentioned, the standing patients, you know, patients with trauma generally don't like to stand up. Uh, I think I would imagine positioning even for upper extremities yes. is probably the biggest downside. Is that, is that correct? Yes. So because the detectors are fixed uh, to the machine, so you cannot really change the trajectory of the, uh, you know, the image. Uh, intensifier relative to the anatomy of the patient. So, you know, you, you can't really necessarily put your elbow in a certain position to give you the kind of uh, magnification and also the, uh, the positioning that you need uh, for, say, an elbow x-ray. That's why we do not uh, typically utilize them for these small joints where you have to position the patient in a certain way uh, to get these images. So, yes, EOS is limited. It is uh, really only for certain uh, deformities of uh, the lower extremity and the spine uh, for the most part. Um, we do use them for bone age and uh, some hip um, alignment measurement type of stuff. Uh, for example, femoral acetabular uh, impingement, uh, cam lesion, that sort of thing. But uh, we do not use them routinely for all. Uh, it, it is not a replacement for, very, for all the regular x-rays. That's basically the point here. Yes. Great. Well, I would, uh, I would suggest if, uh, do we have any questions in the audience about EOS? I'm at least for myself, learned a lot about uh, when I should be using this more frequently. But um, and any further information about this, we will try to add uh, within the link at, at Copy Kids Sports Medicine Online. If anyone has any additional questions about EOS uh, or wants to know more information uh, about it, um, Dr. Chang, what else are we talking about this morning? <laughs> uh, all right, so let's uh, let's move on to the next section of our presentation. Uh, so before talking about how to interpret elbow. Uh, radiographs, we need to review uh, what normal elbow x-rays look like. Uh, please remember that uh, when you're ordering x-rays, always, always try to get at least two orthogonal views of the anatomy of interest. This is because x-ray is a two-dimensional modality and human body is three-dimensional, so you need more than one view to adequately assess the anatomy. Um, getting one view, only one view of the x-ray is like driving down a curvy road with one blind eye. It can be kind of dangerous. Um, so always get two views. Yes, at least, uh, if possible. Um, so, standard, uh, so standard two view elbow x-rays include AP and lateral views. Uh, as you can see here on the AP view of the elbow, will give you a frontal view where you can see majority of the anatomy uh, straight on. Here are some annotated images where you can see the distal humerus uh, projecting over the olecranon. The capitellum articulates with radio head on the lateral side, the humeral trochlea articulates with the coronary process of the ulna on the medial side. Uh, AP view is the preferred view to evaluate for medial and lateral epicondyle pathology. 
Here's the lateral view, which is the orthogonal projection of the AP elbow. It allows for examination of the onotrochlear joint uh, process, sorry, uh, coronal process and olecranon process of the ona. It also use, is used to assess elbow alignment, which we'll go into in a little bit later. So here is some images here to show you the anatomy. On the lateral view, you see the radio capitella joint between the radio head and cap rounded capitellum, which is outlined by yellow. On a trochlear joint between the round trochlea and semicircular shaped trochlear notch of the ulna, outlined in green. You can assess the coronoid process for fracture and also the olecranon for fracture in this lateral view. You can see a thin sliver of lucency, uh, vertically oriented lucency in front of the distal humerus uh, at the level of coronoid fossa. This is the anterior fat pad in its normal anatomic position. And posteriorly here, you do not see a normal fat pad in the normal elbow. So now let's look at some cases here. Um, so our first case is a two-year-old boy with elbow injury. On the standard I, two, I, yeah, may, I may interrupt real quick yeah, just sure, because sure. I want to, I, I, I'm really curious. Yes. Um, for, for those of you guys that are here in the audience that, that see patients, um, do, do you ever have a, a mom hand you an x-ray report that just says, I don't know what this means, can you interpret it for me? Or, or do I need to go to the emergency room tonight? Does that, does that ever happen? I'll show of hands. Is that, okay, so I think every, everyone says this. Dr. Podeswa in the back says it happens to him a lot. Um, so, so oftentimes we, you know, oftentimes we get an x-ray report and have no clue what it means, especially if you don't look at x-rays on a routine basis. So, um, Dr. Chang, I may just add, what, what would, can, can you just ad lib how you would, w without giving away a diagnosis, how, what would your radiology report say here? Okay, so for this one, um, <laughs> Put me on the spot there. I'm putting you uh, on the spot, but yes. just, just so, so, so for this one specifically, um, what I'll probably say is that uh, there is elevated anterior and posterior fat pad, or some people say fat pad sign. Um, I'm gonna bring the arrow out so you can see what we're talking about. And uh, I'll probably say, you know, no acute space fracture, and, uh, you know, radio capitella and humoral alignment is preserved. And uh, that's pretty much about it. So, it's perfect, actually. So, normal x-ray with a fat pad sign. And, and, and impression, I'll say see results above. There, there you go. go. <laughs> perfect. Uh, well, I think we have a, case, a further case that goes along with this. Yeah. So, if we'll skip to that next slide. Okay. So, uh, anyway, so what I was going to ask you was, you know, like, do you want to talk a little bit about this uh, x-ray that I just showed you? Like, perfect. Perfect. Yeah. yeah. So, I, I mean, this is... Chair, this has got to be a common scenario, is to say, yes, my sir. kid fell, um, you know, he's, he's not moving his elbow, uh, and, you know, I got, a, I got an x-ray report that says normal x-ray with a fat pad sign. How, com how common is that? Do you get calls about that? It's pretty common. Um, I would say give it till 930 today. We'll probably have one or two of these through the door. Uh, so it's, it's an extremely common scenario. And I, I think this really happens a lot to pediatricians, to, I mean, anybody that, that's really treating kids these radiology reports come back and sometimes they're a little ambiguous. And the, and the thing that we always miss is that there's no clinical exam for the radiologist, right? So that correlation is really important. So yeah, this is a very common scenario for us. Uh, this is, as you guys can see, this is Chris. I think we all know Chris. Anybody with kids knows Chris. Uh, Chris is that two-year-old that you went to go change shirts or take out the trash and you left him laying on the bed watching a show and you come back and he's jumping on the bed and then Chris falls off and you hope it's not on your watch, but, but sometimes it is. Um, it happens all the time, and, and these things come in with, with this presentation. This is probably one of our more common diagnoses. It, is a positive fat pad sign mean something's wrong with the elbow? Generally, yes, yeah, something's wrong with the elbow. The degree of what may be wrong is, is kind of where you have to figure out the devil in the details. Um, I think there's a, a little bit later we'll kind of allude to, to some of the uh, statistics. Here we go with this study from Skaggs and uh, Mizran in, in L.A. Some of our colleagues out in L.A. did a study and, you know, identified that with the this – fat pad sign or that effusion sign that, you, you know, basically what they're telling us is if you see the sign but you don't see a fracture, you need to look harder. Uh, there's 53%, so half of the time we're, we're looking at a supercondylar fracture or what we call an occult supercondylar fracture when we don't really see that fracture line through there. 
then the proximal ulna, the lateral condyle, and the radial neck kind of follow in, in that order. You know, and this really all boils down to the clinical exam. So when we get this report, our job is really to try to identify and kind of investigate a little bit more about where is this child tender, what was the mechanism of injury. Fortunately for a lot of these, when you look at like the ulna, for instance, it's, it's really superficial there. It's pretty easy to palpate that and kind of get the idea of is this sore in the ulna or we sort the distal humerus. Now, this two-year-old's not going to be able to tell you any of that, but your exam kind of help you kind of get to the, the details with that. So a positive fat pad sign needs... You, you need to do a, an adequate physical exam to establish a diagnosis, but there's definitely something wrong. You can't ignore that. You shouldn't ignore that, no. Okay. All right, well, let's, so, let's figure out okay. why that is. <laughs> so anyway, so these are the follow-up uh, x-rays uh, for this child uh, three weeks later. And uh, if you can follow the arrow, there is a periosteal reaction in the distal humerus, both on the posterior side and uh, the medial side. Uh, so this is a uh, non-displaced, uh, healing non-displaced supraconductor fracture that did not declare itself on the original uh, radiograph. Okay. So real quick on that, from, from okay. our standpoint, when these kids come in, if we had this patient present exactly like we're described, again, it's all the, the details is really going to come down to the clinical exam. And so for this kid, likely to have tenderness around the distal humerus. And so I may leave that day saying, well, he's got an effusion sign, he had trauma, and he's sore at that distal humerus, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to elect to treat this kid. It's not like this kid's going to be in a cast for six weeks. These things heal quickly. Uh, the, the blood supply is robust in, in the elbow, and so we tend to put this kid in a cast, give him three weeks in a cast, let him heal, bring him back, and, and oftentimes this is what we're able to see is this little change, that little periosteal elevation. You can see the white arrows are pointing to to kind of tell the family, okay, here was that fracture. It's healed. Now let's get you know, Chris moving, get this elbow a little less stiff than it is, and they tend to do really well. Okay, so <clears throat> now let's go over the, uh, the five steps uh, to reviewing an elbow, pediatric elbow x-ray. Uh, number one, uh, is there a positive fat pass sign, which is, um, would indicate joint effusion, and usually the first clue to injury, as Jared and Dr. Ellis just mentioned. Number two, is elbow alignment normal? Uh, anterior humeral line and uh, radiocapitular line will help you uh, figure that out. And uh, number three, are the ossification centers in the right place? Um, number four, is there a subtle non-displaced fracture? Number five, uh, you want to make sure that what looks odd to you is not just normal finding in a skeletally mature child. Uh, I want to emphasize that you know if you can simply use steps one to three, you will probably find 90% of elbow injuries or fractures uh, by applying those first three rules. So uh, step one again, this is just a rehash of what we just talked about. Uh, so what is a positive fat pass sign? Uh, look at the picture to the left. Uh, normally on the lateral view of the elbow, a fat pad is seen at the anterior aspect of the joint. This is normal perisynovial fat covering the joint capsule. <clears throat> on the posterior side, no fat pad is normally seen because the posterior fat pad hides inside a deep intercondylar fossa. The two images to the right basically show us that joint effusion can elevate the anterior fat pad and make the posterior fat pad visible, and this is what a positive fat pad sign is. So I, I, I would just second that, and, and I, I would 100% uh, I, I agree with what Jared was saying, is, is I think if I ever see a fat pad sign on a radiology report, I think there, there, is, a, there is a fracture there somewhere. We just can't see it. Um, because the cartilage in a pediatric elbow is, there's so much more cartilage than bone, and we don't see injuries sometimes through the cartilage. And so any fat pad sign is a fracture. Um, I would say, most of the time, if you really want to get detailed, is the posterior fat pad in the back of the elbow, if you see any fat pad sign, and, and I, I think um, Dr. Chang was saying it quite nicely, but if you see, you see this black here, that, that's the effusion, that's fluid in the elbow, and that's what we're calling a fat pad sign, is when you have, this is normal tissue, that grayish pattern, and then when you see a little bit of that darkness there, that means there's fluid in the elbow. And that's indicative of a fat pad sign. It's pushing out that fat pad, and that fat pad is not as dense as the other tissue around the elbow, so that's why it comes out black, because it doesn't, it doesn't uh, light up when you shoot a radiation beam. 
the anterior fat pad sign, every once in a while you can see it, but we call it the sail sign because it makes it look like a little bit of a triangle when it gets pushed out, like there's some swelling there. So you can see, you see how it looks like a little bit of a triangle, like there's a sail on the front part of that anterior, hum uh, on the front part of that bone there. So those are, those are to me, if a radiologist ever says a positive fat pad sign, you don't even need to worry about that because if a radiologist says that, radiologists say that, then it's most likely they're, they're making their assessment that there is fluid in the joint, something is wrong. If it's a traumatic injury, it's likely a fracture. If it's a kid that's just had elbow pain for three months, it may mean they have swelling because of some other issue that needs to be evaluated. Either way, fluid in the elbow joint is not normal and probably needs to be evaluated. So a positive fat pad sign is kind of one of those, what does this mean? But the reality is it probably means something needs, needs to be further evaluated. Okay, so <clears throat> moving on. Uh, step two, how do you assess proper elbow alignment? The anterior humeral line, uh, as you've seen here in blue, is joined along the front part of the humerus. It should pass through the anterior one-third to one-half of the capitellum. A radial capitellar line runs through the central radius and passes through the center of the capitellum on a normal image. Uh, keep in mind that it is important to assess the radial capitellar line on all images and not just the lateral view, because even on AP view, you can see it. Step three, there are six ossification centers around the elbow joint. They appear and fuse to the adjacent bone at different ages. It is important to know the sequence and appearance of the appearance since the ossification centers always appear in a very strict order. This order of appearance is specified in the mnemonic C-R-I-T-O-E, CRITO, uh, which stands for capitellum, radius, uh, internal or medial bicondyle, trochlea, olecranon, uh, lateral or external bicondyle. So it is not important to memorize the age at which these ossification centers appear as they are highly variable between individuals. The important thing is to keep in mind is that um, an, an ossification center that is misplaced or out of uh, is missing or out of place could indicate an underlying uh, injury. I, you know, if you, yes. If you can go back to that. Yeah. Uh, I, I may just ask Jared. <coughs> You know, there's so many different lines and extra pieces of bone in the elbow, and, and you have a kid who you suspect there's a fracture, and the radiology report may say normal elbow development, but cannot rule out a fracture. You guys say that every once in a while. I, I, I never say that. So what, uh, what are some tips that when you, when you look at it, all these ossification centers, because the reality is, is a lot of us that don't look at elbows a lot are not going to remember them all. But what are some tips that we could come up with knowing that there's a lot of growth plates around the elbow? How do we figure it out if it's a fracture or if it's normal? Yeah, I think that's a challenge. I think that's a challenge for even us that, that do this every day. Um, you know, from, from a primary care perspective or from an emergency room or an urgent care, if you're trying to interpret these, you know, honestly, I would say if you focus on that radio capitellar line, the anterior humeral joint line, and the effusion sign, those three signs, if you will look at every elbow x-ray and you, you play those three scenarios out and you make sure that you're not missing something there, it's less important to get caught up in these details to me because ultimately you're not gonna be treating that patient long term. So you know there's something going on in this elbow. You know if it's one of the bad things. So um, if those radiocapteller lines aren't lining up, if the anterior humeral lines not lining up, those are things that need to be maybe, uh, not always, but may need to be expedited in treatment. Um, if you don't have those, if those lines all line up but you have a joint effusion, you're not really so sure what the diagnosis is, to me, it's not necessarily something you have to figure out with these. That's something you know you're going to splint and you're going to refer and you're going to get over to us and let us kind of sort that out. That's what we're, that's what we're here for. Uh, I think these are important to know. I think from our perspective, we have to know them. Uh, but from the primary care perspective, I wouldn't say that that's something that is you know, critical to know the details of these. I think it's important to know those are there. Um, I think it can help you if you really wanted to dive into it to be familiar with them. But I just don't know that it's that important to know the details of it. So do you... Um when you get an x-ray that either the radiology report, you are having trouble figuring out what their read is and you look at it and you're scratching your head a little bit um, as a provider, do you ever think or utilize the option to get an x-ray on the other elbow? 
Yeah, it's a, that's an option as well. Um, I mean, th that gives you kind of the baseline normal because I'll tell, I'll tell families a lot of times, you know, if I took 10 kids that are seven years old and line them all up and get x-rays and none of them have trauma, I may get three or four different variations that are pretty significant based on that child's growth and development where they're at on that curve. Uh, so, you know, one seven-year-old's elbow may not look exactly like another one, and, and looking at that contralateral view really gives you an idea of that, that child's baseline and what it should look like. Uh, that's also a simple, a simple way to kind of compare the two. So, yeah, I definitely think that's a good, good thing to utilize. And if you still seem to be confused, because there's a little fleck of bone somewhere where it shouldn't be, and there's a little bit of swelling, and you're trying to figure out how bad is this, um, and the... You, you see a little piece of bone that you think is a growth plate, but on the images on the other elbow, you don't see it there. Does that mean that the kid needs an MRI, or, or are there other options to look at, to look at before you go there? Uh, you can do a physical exam to figure out. Um, right, yeah, so uh, knowing that there's a physical exam there and knowing that you're trying to establish whether there's a more serious injury or not, I guess w what I'm going to is a little bit of, I'll just read my mind, but, it, but is there a role when you're looking <laughs> at the x-ray and you can't really figure out what's going on because elbow x-rays in pediatrics is sometimes very, very challenging, yeah. you know, can you use ultrasound? Uh, yes, you can, yes. Um, we uh, do it from time to time, especially in skeletally immature uh, patients where, you know, they these ossifications um, were not even ossified yet, and uh, there's a question of whether or not the, uh, the fracture occurs in the cartilaginous ossification uh, centers, and we've done that, and you can see um, any disruption of where the, you know, the formed uh, long bone joins the ossification center that are still cartilaginous. If you see a defect there, it can um, signify that there is a fracture of an ossified uh, epiphysis. So uh, just, just a little bit of a, of, a, of a conclusion or concluding after the first three steps of reading an elbow x-ray. Jared, would you, uh, and Dr. Chang, would you agree that um, if you looked for the swelling inside the elbow uh, with the fat pad sign and you looked for overall alignment, yes. what we described as that anterior humeral line or the radio capitellar line, and you just knew that there were a lot of growth plates around the elbow, having knowledge of those things would, would pretty much pretty much allow you to pick up 80 to 90 percent of most major elbow injuries. Yes. Yeah, I think that I, I absolutely agree. I, I think the big piece we're missing there again, though, is that physical exam. I think you can't yeah. discount that. I think that's probably um, more important than anything else is, you know, correlating what you're seeing on that x-ray with where this child's sore, uh, not just taking a report and saying, oh, well, this is what the radiologist said it is. Not that our radiologists are ever wrong, uh, <laughs> but you got to remember they don't have the benefit of having that child in front of them. They don't have that, that physical exam, and so it's a really challenging job to do this in the dark without that exam. So, you know, it's, it's a beautiful thing when you can correlate the two and, and kind of combine those findings. I mean, that's why we love these guys. I mean, when they order x-rays, they tell us where the pain is, so that makes us look good, um, so we don't miss anything. Uh, so uh, let's go to, uh, let's apply what we learned so far. Uh, here, is, here are AP and lateral x-rays of a six-year-old girl who fell off monkey bars. Uh, take a second to evaluate the uh, fat pads um, and elbow alignment. Um, see. Um, do you see anterior fat pad, posterior fat pad? Do you see both? Um, so yes, um, there is elevated anterior and posterior uh, fat pads indicating large joint effusion in this patient. Um, what do you think about the uh, anterior human line and uh, radio capitella line? Does anything look out of place to you? So yes, the anterior human line is abnormal. It runs anterior to the capitellum. And you can also see with this uh, white uh, dashed line here that the distal humeral condyles are posteriorly angulated um, relative to the, uh, the shaft. And um, radio capitella line alignment is, uh, is satisfactory in this patient. And uh, how about the ossification centers? Uh, how many do you identify, and are they in the right place? I know this is not important, but uh, let's just run through the exercise here. <laughs> so here you see uh, capitellum, radio head, medial bicondyle, and a small trochlear ossification center overlapping the olecranon. Uh, they are normally positioned. The lateral epicondyle and also the olecranon ossification centers are not yet visible. So let's turn to our orthopedic experts. Uh, what type of injury is this, and how do you manage it? So <clears throat> this is a supracondylar fracture. Um, can, can you go back to that one slide? Yeah. 
Thank you. So as you pointed out, the, there's a little extension in this fracture. So it's a little bit different than the last one we saw. There is a, you know, a clear fracture identified. You can still see the effusion, uh, but there's some extension that that anterior humeral line really doesn't line up. Uh, so this is a fracture that needs a little work. It needs, um, you know, this is one that, that very likely is going to go to the operating room and, and have some pins uh, put in to, to kind of correct that alignment and uh, restore that kind of anatomic alignment and give this elbow a better chance to heal in a, in a more anatomic location. So I personally am putting this kid in a splint and calling Dr. Ellis to say, hey, what day do you want to fix this elbow? Well, more importantly is, um, you know, it, in uh, a supracondylar fracture of the elbow is one that um, we get a little nervous about when you hear those words. Uh, and the reason is, is there's a, there's a large range of severity, but when you have what we would call a type three, which is a completely displaced, and you can see that up there on the image, completely displaced type three, those are the elbow fractures that are a little bit more at risk of having nerve or artery, or even more importantly, severe swelling problems. And those are the ones that really require uh, a recommendation to go to the emergency room to be evaluated. Uh, they oftentimes need to be fixed either in the middle of the night or first thing in the morning. And, and, and a clue to that, if you don't have an x-ray, is what you see right there on that bottom image is when you have a large area of bruising right in the front of the elbow. You may, there may be so much swelling you can't see the arm looks crooked. But you know, if you have a super calm, if, if the radiologist, if you suspect an elbow injury, but the elbow looks okay, and there's not a lot of swelling, and it's a Friday afternoon at 6 p.m., and the physical therapist is the only healthcare professional that the family can talk to about their x-ray findings, do they need to go to the emergency room, and what cues would you give a family about when they need to go to an emergency room versus when can they call the doctor on Monday morning? Yeah, that's probably a real scenario that, that, you know, is probably more and more frequently going to occur as, uh, you know, these y'all's practices continue to grow and uh, with some of the changes in our healthcare system in general. Uh, to me, if uncontrolled pain, you know, obviously that's a reason. Uh, swelling or neurovascular concerns, when you look at this elbow and you see that kind of puckering and that um, bruising over the, the anterior crease there, you know, that's, that's a sign of a problem or an impending problem that, that could arise. And so these are kids that need to get a splint or immobilized, you know, whatever you have. Uh, a sling would be a good thing to have at a practicing where you see kids, just a simple sling to have, kind of a borrowed sling that you can put somebody in and get them from point A to point B. Uh, but yeah, if these kids show up with this much swelling or swelling in that elbow, they can't really control the pain. If they have any uh, neurovascular findings, you know, you're questioning the pulse, the capillary field, things down in the hand. Um, there's some simple tests you can go through on the hand to kind of identify any neurovascular concerns from a, uh, a nerve issues that certainly can occur with these. But I think that in general, the swelling that you see without the ability to have that x-ray, if you see the swelling is significant, uh, you see ecchymosis or that bruising in the front, I think those are two signs that you need to send them and then that uncontrolled pain. So what does uncontrolled pain mean? That's obviously a little bit of subjective, but if you've got a five-year-old and they cry for 10, 15 minutes in there and then they've calmed down and you can get a good exam, kind of evaluate things a little bit better. Well, that's not really uncontrolled pain. You've kind of got them back in control. You've got them calmed down. Uh, but if you just can't get this child to calm down and the, the swelling, uh, you know, is severe like this, I think that's something you need to go ahead and send into the ER. Uh, or if you have a colleague that you know of that, that does ortho, give them a call and say, hey, you know, what do you think I need to do with this kid? I think having those resources, us all leaning on each other is pretty important. Yeah, and I think um, aside from the clinical presentation of the patient, um, most things from a radiologist that would suggest a minimally displaced fracture um, oftentimes does not need to go to the emergency room. If the pain is controlled, not a lot of swelling, but you see a fracture uh, and even an elbow fracture that even describes small amounts of displacement, minimally displaced, Oftentimes, those are ones that don't need to go to the emergency room in the middle of the night. And those are ones, even in the supercolor of the elbow, those minimally displaced ones, they usually do really well. And they, even, even the ones that, uh, even the one that we saw earlier that was not as severe as this, oftentimes those, as long as the child is comfortable, um, it's best to wait till Monday morning and, and save the family some resources and the ER resources as well. Um, Again, with, with some of the clinical cues that would change uh, my recommendation, but sometimes we can uh, allow some, for some of those just to be seen the next day or even the following Monday. Okay, uh, let's uh, practice a little bit more. Uh, 
the three steps. Uh, here we have a five-year-old girl who jumped off a swing, uh, landing on an outstretched arm. Um, do you see a FEPA sign? How about the alignment and the ossification centers? Uh, clearly, there is an elevated uh, anterior fat pad. Um, anterior humeral line looks okay. However, the uh, radiocapitellar line is anterior to the capitellum on this lateral x-ray, uh, indicating uh, radio head dislocation. Um, and the uh, visualized capitellum and radio head ossification centers are normal on this AP view. Um, so, Dr. Ellis and Jared, what, um, I'm sorry, there we go. What do we uh, do for this? Um, Radio. Can you go back one slide real quick? Yes. I do want to point out what Dr. Els was talking about earlier on that, that fat pad sign or that effusion sign. This is one of those ones that's a little bit more subtle in regards to the effusion. When you look at this, uh, the lateral view, there's a little anterior cell sign. It really, you really can't make out the cell there. I think it kind of looks like a little cell. Can you trace that with the mouse on there? Will it let you trace that on okay. there? Okay. Uh, I don't know if you can see it. Um, I but I, I think that's a really good example of one. We'll use this pointer real quick and kind of show it. What's uh, not the bottom? One. Something happened here. Okay, now it's back. Right here, you see this, where it looks like a cell. I think that's a really good example of what an anterior cell sign looks like. But you can see that posterior fat pad or that posterior elevated fat pad is not really that prominent. It's a little bit harder to pick up there. Uh, so you know there are variations to these. Uh, why would you think, uh, Dr. Chang? Why why don't you see that posterior fat pad quite as well here? Uh, so. It depends on the size of the uh, joint effusion. Uh, sometimes, you know, if you have small joint effusion, it is large enough only to displace the anterior fat pad, and the posterior fat pad is not displaced at that point, so you may not see the posterior um, fat pad at that point. So whenever you see posterior, that means there's significant uh, joint effusion. Um, gotcha, so you'd say the posterior one is, is probably more of indicative of? Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay, so let's see if we can move forward here. Um, so anyway, so this, this is the radial uh, head dislocation, and uh, clinically, they thought this child has a Montagia fracture, and the child went through um, reduction, um, closed reduction, and uh, eventually had a cast put in, and uh, she did well uh, afterwards. Um, so next case uh, is number four. Uh, this is a 12-year-old girl who fell on the right uh, elbow during a soccer game and heard a pop. Um, what do you think about these x-rays? Um, well, I think there's no definite fat pad sign. I mean, the uh, lateral view is kind of poorly done. It's kind of oblique. Uh, so it's really hard to uh, evaluate the alignment on this lateral view. But the uh, radio capitular line is maintained on the AP view. Um, there is a medial elbow uh, soft tissue swelling there. And what about the ossification centers? Uh, this patient is more uh, skeletally mature. And all the ossification centers are predominantly fused, except for this medial epicondyle, which is um, has a gap from the humerus and uh, also is slightly inferiorly displaced from the donor site. Um, this looks like a medial epicondyle fracture. Uh, so what do we do for this experts? Yeah, I think this is a great x-ray for to, to further establish a point. And I'm going to borrow this clicker here. Uh, but uh, the, the reality is, is this is a great x-ray where our first two steps uh, alignment and, and fat pad sign really are, are negative here. Uh, but the reality is, is you see this little bone here, and you may think that that's a normal, normal ossification, which it is actually. Uh, but the reality is, is if the patient is tender there, heard a pop there, then maybe it's a little bit more than that. And this one seems pretty obvious to me just because we see these uh, frequently, but this bone belongs up here. But let's say you didn't know that, you could always get an x-ray on the other side. It's a great opportunity to say, hey, listen, I know there's a lot of growth plates around the elbow. I don't know if this is where it's supposed to be. I don't know if it's not where it's supposed to be. And I'm in, you know, Oklahoma somewhere. I don't have an orthopedic surgeon that I can talk to. Uh, but the reality is this is where you get an x-ray of the other elbow. And you can get a great view to have a better idea of as if this is the normal position and location of a one of the ossification centers, or the, what I would say, the growth plate around the elbow. Uh, this particular injury doesn't always need to be fixed surgically, uh, but if, if you like to throw or tumble, it really needs to be fixed because you'll lose a lot of the major stabilizers to the inside of your elbow. All right, so uh, quickly, step four. Uh, you want to look for, um, uh, hold on, sorry. So case number 
five, sorry, two slides here. Uh, so this case is a 15-year-old boy who fell off his bike. Uh, I'm sure now you can appreciate the anterior and posterior fat pads easily. Uh, elbow alignment is good. This patient is uh, skeletally mature, uh, even though lacrimal ossification uh, center is fused. And uh, by comparing the normal right elbow to the abnormal left elbow, can you spot the uh, subtle fracture? So this is time to uh, talk about step number four, which is to identify the subtle non-displaced fracture. So where and how do you look for these subtle fractures? You want to pay attention to the metaphysis of the long bones where they tend to occur, and you want to make sure that the bony cortex has a nice, smooth shape like a ski slope. And image to the right is an example of normal uh, radial neck cortex. So let's go back to our case. Uh, do you, so you want to pay close attention to the radial neck, distal humerus, and proximal ulna metaphysis. Do you see the subtle finding there? If you don't, let's blow it up. Uh, so now you can see that there is angulation um, at the uh, left radial neck that is, you don't see on the right side. And um, so this looks like a radial neck buccal fracture. And uh, basically, buccal fracture, so um, these children, uh, children have softer, uh, more flexible bone. And then um, so sometimes fracture occur where the bone just kind of buckle and not breaking, and so that you get that little uh, cortical uh, angular abnormality. And um, sometimes you see them in different names. You might hear radiologists saying buccal fracture or torus fracture or even a complete fracture, and we really mean to say the same thing, so just to confuse people. Um, next case uh, is number six. Uh, so I'm going to ask ahead. a couple questions on that. So sure. uh, I, I, I want to emphasize that Physiologically, yes. uh, a buckle or a torus fracture is, is a fracture. Yes. We, we still treat it as if it's a fracture. Yes. Okay. And the, the second question is, um, wh why don't we hear about this in adults? Uh, because adult bones are much, much stronger. So if there is a lot of tensile strength, it will clearly break and not buckle. So that's why you see it less often in elderly. Well, you may see it in elderly, but not you know, young, strong men like you. Well, I would, I would almost, yeah, I completely agree. And this is, a, this is really a, not to that point. Uh, the, um, the buckling nature of a pediatric bone is, is really quite different. A bone, like you were saying, it's very, it, adult bone is brittle. Um, when it cracks, it cracks, and you see a line there. But a kid's bone is much softer, and so sometimes you'll see that buckling effect that an adult radiologist or someone who's used to treating adults may not be used to seeing that or addressing that. But, uh, but the reality is, is we do see this really frequently in kids that are almost like minor or, or, or they, they are definite fractures. We've got to treat it like fracture. But you'll just see a little bit of a blip in the bone, and sometimes you think it's even like a, um, you think there's even a, a like a spot on your screen that you're trying to scratch off when you're looking at the x-ray, but the reality is, is it's a fracture that oftentimes needs to be treated. Yeah, to me, the, the clinical piece of these, these really subtle radial neck fractures is uh, they will come in and, and most of the time they're going to be complaining of both wrist pain and elbow pain. Uh, a lot of times you'll get primarily wrist pain, but then when you go and palpate that wrist, there's really not soreness over the wrist. Uh, what they, they typically will have is loss of terminal extension. They can't really completely extend their arm. They'll maybe lack 10 degrees, and then they, they really get, get pretty tense if you try to get them any further. Uh, or, or, and rather, they will have pronation and supination. They'll have pain with rotation of that forearm, and then just focal tenderness over that radial neck. So you can palpate up and down that distal humerus and usually get you know, no, no real response. The you know, lecranon's uh, very easy to palpate, so you can check there. Uh, and then you get over that radial neck, which I usually do last and kind of, you know, thinking this is probably my diagnosis after I've gone through the, the loss of terminal extension, the loss of rotation, uh, and then kind of palpate over that radial neck and you'll find it, oh yeah, that's, that's where they're sore. Um, and, and most of the time, that little triad is what they will present with clinically with this particular injury. This is a fall on an outstretched arm uh, majority of the time. Okay. So next case, uh, number six, uh, let's look at a nine-year-old baseball pitcher with elbow pain. Um, again, there's no fat pad sign, alignment is good. Uh, there's no radial neck uh, buckle fracture. And uh, you see all six elbow ossification centers here. Um, the olecranon ossification looks slightly irregular. Uh, trochlea and lateral epicondyle ossification centers look like there are multiple pieces in there. The medial epicondyle looks a little irregular and maybe a little white looking. Um, not sure what's going on. So this is a good time to uh, go over the last step of uh, reading elbow x-rays. So this step requires you to take a step back and decide whether or not what looks 
abnormal to you is actually normal appearance in a skeletally immature child so that you don't mistakenly call a fracture that is not there. As you can see from this series of normal elbow x-rays of different ages, the elbow occupation centers ossified and enlarge over time and become fused to the uh, primary bones. Uh, skeletally mature patients have radiolucent growth centers composed of cartilage and sometimes bone, which may not be completely visualized on x-ray. As these secondary ossification centers mature, they can have irregular margins, multiple smaller ossification components, or apparent gap between bones. These normal developmental findings can sometimes be mistaken for injury. Let's look at the olecranon, for example. Uh, olecranon ossification center appears around age nine. It can have more than one ossification center. Uh, look at the uh, red circle on the x-ray to the left, and you see that these two ossification centers eventually fuse into a larger olecranon ossification center. So here's an example of the uh, olecranon ossification, uh, olecranon process secondary ossification center uh, that was thought to represent a fracture or a joint body. Uh, using the CT-like MRI sequence, we're able to show that this is a secondary ossification center contained within the larger olecranon epiphyseal cartilage, separate from the primary larger olecranon ossification center. But how do you tell if no MRI is available or ultrasound is available? Um, so in the radiology reading room, we look for clues to suggest that there is no acute injury, uh, for example, no joint effusion or no soft tissue swelling. And we also look at old x-rays and x-rays of the opposite elbow uh, to give us any clues. If abnormality looks symmetric on both sides, it's probably okay with few exceptions. Uh, we also look at reference books to learn what young bones look like. But I want to tell you that you guys are lucky. You don't have to go to radiology residency to learn how to read these films because most, the single most important tool uh, to identify these uh, findings, whether they're normal or abnormal, is actually history and physical, which we sort of went into a little bit, but we will go into a little bit more. So let's go back to our case of the nine-year-old baseball pitcher. Um, so which of the following is abnormal? Is it A, marginal irregularities about the electron and ossification center, B, multiple irregular ossifications in the lateral epicondyle, C, multiple irregular ossifications in the trochlea, or D, marginal irregularities and possible sclerosis in the medial epicondyle. So the good news is we can you know, touch the patient. So, so we're on physical exam, the only finding is medial, become, medial elbow tenderness to palpation. This automatically eliminates findings A, B, C from consideration and put them in the category of normal developmental findings, which they are. You have identified the medial epicondyle as the pertinent radiographic abnormality simply by touching the patient. How cool is it? So uh, we did get uh, contralateral elbow x-ray like we talked about before um, on these kids. And uh, so here, it, it, you can see the difference between right and left elbow. And uh, it shows that the right medial epicondyle growth plate is wider than the left. The medial epicondyle is more sclerotic or white on the x-ray. Uh, this again confirms that the medial epicondyle is abnormal finding. However, both medial epicondyle evulsion fracture and medial epicondyle epophysitis can look like this on x-ray. So experts, how do we decide what is what? Boy, those were, uh, that, that was a great example. Um, and the, the reality is I would have thought that was going to be an olecranon problem uh, had I not had a physical exam because the olecranon apophysis looks pretty wide yeah. on that one. But uh, clearly the contralateral images and physical exam will do it. Uh, and I would tell you the difference uh, from my perspective in whether you have an overuse condition or you have a fracture is all based on the history. So the history will allow you to get to that conclusion as well. Um, and I, I, may, uh, I may ask Jared for one comment here, and then uh, we're going to wrap up for some questions. Thank you. Yeah, I agree. Uh, history is going to be really important with this one. You're going to look for the kid that's uh, coming in with six weeks of elbow pain intermittently or kind of that history, this insidious onset uh, versus a, a patient that either felt a pop when they threw the ball, felt one immediate pop, immediate pain. Uh, or maybe they were doing some uh, tumbling and they, they kind of landed wrong, felt a pop. They felt maybe their elbow slid in and out. Uh, kind of that description of one acute event versus kind of this insidious onset. And that's really going to help you kind of guide whether or not you're looking at an, an avulsion fracture uh, or a uh, apophyseal injury with just a little bit of uh, inflammation through it. That's kind of the way I would approach it. 
Yeah, I think that's uh, I think that's probably pretty reasonable. Now, um, Dr. Chang, I can't I can't thank you enough. I think that was ex some extremely helpful uh, information, particularly for people uh, who don't look at elbows uh, on a regular basis like we do. And I would I would encourage you guys that if you haven't if you if you have a patient with an elbow uh, that, that this is a great r refresher to to kind of flip through to understand an elbow X-ray because I do think it's very very confusing um, to really understand elbow X-rays and, and what's normal and what's not. So I think that was extremely helpful. Those five steps I think are, are re really key tools. Uh, can can I open up any questions that you guys may have either about the X-rays? Uh, of the elbow, radiology in general, pediatric radiology in general, or, or the EOS machine. I'm going to see if I can get the microphone over there. You talked a little bit about uh, diagnostic ultrasound at the beginning. Um, <clears throat> so my question is, how do you determine when you're going to use diagnostic ultrasound versus MRI for soft tissue injuries or bone injuries? Do you want to take this first before I? Uh, yeah, so uh, I th uh, number one is probably the most important part of ultrasound is having somebody who does it well, um, particularly with musculoskeletal ultrasound, I think is a, is a very specific niche. So before I would recommend utilizing that on a regular basis, you got to be sure that you have a radiologist who is skilled and trained in musculoskeletal ultrasound because it is very much user dependent. Um, that being said, a lot of it then looks at what am I, what am I looking for and how am I going to treat this based on the information that I need. If I'm going to eventually get an MRI, then I, I won't get the ultrasound. But if the ultrasound could help me decide surgery, no surgery, and I can come up with a specific question, then I think an ultrasound is really, really valuable. But in my hands, I communicate that with the radiologist and, and ask a very specific question. You know, oftentimes when we get x-rays of the knee or even an MRI, we use very broad terms for the radiologist. I think in an ultrasound, if you have a very specific question, it can be extremely valuable from a musculoskeletal standpoint to say, hey, I'm looking to see if there is an avulsion of the ulnar cradle ligament of the elbow. And to me, that's where ultrasound is really, really valuable. And it can save someone not only the cost of an MRI, but the uh, convenience as well. Yeah, so uh, to answer your question a little bit, uh, so with ultrasound you can look at abnormalities of soft tissue and uh, cartilage in a skeletally immature child. But if there's someone who is really skeletally mature, um, some of the findings may be already be apparent on x-ray or that sometimes the bony uh, structure there may be make it harder to see on ultrasound because ultrasound you basically uh, use a sound wave to see tissue. And uh, it doesn't pass through really dense, hard stuff, such as, you know, a bone. So let's say you have a, you know, like a non-displaced fracture of sorts. On ultrasound, if I get lucky, I might see a crack on the, on the cortex. But if, you know, if it's not really there, I may not be able to see it. But on MRI, it might show that there is a non-displaced fracture that I can potentially miss on uh, ultrasound. So it depends on what you're looking for. But I think ultrasound is a great modality if you have a really young patient where on x-ray it's really hard to see where the bones are and you want to see if there is a fracture in the cartilage or any of the uh, physis or that sort of thing, um, or even ligament injuries. But you know, for really like bony findings, maybe MR is a better finding if you don't see it on x-ray. Okay. Any other questions? Any e-moderated questions, Brandy? Okay. Uh, this was a different style of presentation. I really enjoyed it. Um, I thought it went really well to kind of lean on m multiple specialties on the same session. Uh, but if it was, uh, if you guys loved it, please let us know. Please send me a short email or send someone an email if you guys thought that this style was not as much fun as the other styles. Please let us know. We are usually, uh, we usually just want to make this beneficial to everyone. So please don't hesitate to reach out and let us know what you think. Uh, and we are currently coming up with the lectures for next year. So if you have any ideas, something you want to either give yourself or uh, a subject topic you want to hear from, let us know. We'll try to be sure we get the right expert up here. Thanks again. Thank you. Hey. Man, that was awesome. I thought it, I thought it was really great.